Hello, is this thing on? Do you think they can hear us? Nah, let's say it again. Hi, and welcome to the Gritty Nurse Podcast, an unfiltered discussion related to health and healthcare. My name is Amy. And my name is Sarah. And we are your podcast hosts. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, iHeartRadio, Amazon, or any other podcast listening platform, don't forget to subscribe so you can get updates to when we have our latest episodes. Also, don't forget to rate and review us. And if you like what you're hearing and you love our advocacy work, don't forget to go to www.grittynurse.com and click on the donate button. As little as $1 or $2 a month for a total of $12 a year will help us with our monthly podcast costs such as website hosting, our hosting platform, audio equipment, and the time and energy it takes us to put out good quality episodes. We thank you and we appreciate you. Hi and welcome everyone. I am super excited for the guest that we have today. I have been listening to this particular guest for years. I mean, I remember when I was a nursing student driving all the way in from Brampton to Toronto on my drives, I would listen religiously to uh, CBC radio, particularly to our guests coming up. And I mean, we've also, he's also introduced us to a, a, a number of people, some people that have really touched my heart as well. So I mean, without further ado, Sarah, can you introduce our guest today? Absolutely. And uh, before I do so, I just want to say that he is a jack of all trades. In addition to being a physician, yes. he's also a podcaster. He's in the media. He's an author. I can't even keep track of all the amazing things he does. Um, but maybe what I'll do in this case is I'll have our guest introduce himself quickly to the audience. Well, hi there. My name is Brian Goldman. I am the host of White Coat Black Art on CBC Radio 1. I'm also the host of The Dose, which is a podcast on CBC, one of the CBC podcasts. And I am an emergency physician in Toronto at Sinai Health System. And lately I've been a vaccinator. I'm a vaccinator for Scarborough Health Network, vaccinating people giving them now more often their second dose rather than their first dose of COVID vaccine, which makes me very, very happy. And I'm thrilled to be speaking to you. Super, super amazing. I'm like, I just get chills that you were actually on our show. <laughs> like, I mean, I remember <laughs> when it was just like, I remember when you, when we got that first message to say, like, could we be on your show? I was like shaking. <laughs> I was having goosebumps, all over goosebumps. So, but now the shoe is on the other foot and we are interviewing you today. So I hope you're ready, um, but let's get Sarah to start us off. Okay. And I've got, go I've got goosebumps too. <laughs> I just want you to know we're all in this together, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and just before we start, I have to say for that episode, you guys threw me for a loop. So whoever did background research on the episode must have listened to a lot of our podcasts and realized that I used to avoid getting the flu shot and you threw that in there and I was not prepared, but I think it made for really good content for our episode. And a good learning experience for you. Absolutely. Okay. All right. <laughs> So maybe we can just start by you telling us a little bit about your journey to becoming a healthcare radio host, because this is something that I'm actually really interested in and how that happened. And was there a light bulb moment to where you decided you wanted to go down this path? Yeah, you know what? There actually was a light bulb moment. You know, it's, it's the, the long, there's a long version and a short version of the story. I mean, I've been at this for a long time. I had my first article in the Globe and Mail, like in the 1980s. And I started working in various media in, in the 1980s. So basically, you know, I was down, I was, I was getting pretty far down the path of, of aiming to become a specialist in medicine, a neurologist. And uh, I, uh, I had quite a shock to my system. I, you know, I loved, I loved to write. I knew that I liked to write. I didn't think I wanted to make a career of it. Uh, I had written some of the, you know, comedy sketches at Daffodil, which is the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine uh, annual medical review. And, you know, that was as close as I got to the smell of grease paint. <laughs> right. But, you know, I was I was I was an overachiever in 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 uh, in medicine. In fact, it, it, it's been said that that, you know, I remember that somebody in grade 12 
when I was in high school, one of my classmates said Brian Goldman would study for a blood test. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, they, they, they had other choice words to describe me. And, you know, that at that time, that was very important to me. And I would say I continued that through medical school and, and on to, uh, you know, trying to plan my career from the top down, including uh, doing a two month elective uh, in my final year uh, medical school at Johns Hopkins. And I actually wanted to become, uh, you know, I wanted to become a neurology resident at Johns Hopkins, and I was supposed to present rounds one day. I was a, you know, I'm a lifelong insomniac, and oh and I, my ins- insomnia got much much worse when uh, when I was in medical school, which is probably a sign in and of itself. And uh, I had trouble sleeping, staying asleep, uh, and you know, I slept fitfully when I was at Johns Hopkins uh, every day but one. And that was the morning that I was supposed to give rounds. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I slept in. I slept oh, in God. the morning I was supposed to give rounds. Oh, no. And you know what? It was, it was the worst day of my life. And in retrospect, it was the best day of my life. Because, because you know, if that wasn't a sign from, you know, the, the universe or deity or deities, then, uh, then I don't know what is. But, it, you know, I came back home from that elective pretty convinced. It shattered me in the, it, or it shattered my carefully planned future. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I completely backtracked and I ended up doing a year of pediatrics. I was already uh, signed up to do a year of pediatrics. And then I, I matched that with a year of internal medicine. And um, I published my first article in the Globe and Mail in my year of medical residency, my single year of medical residency. Uh, one article in the Globe and Mail was on estrogen receptors and breast cancer. And, you know, I, I wrote another article and another article. And soon I thought, you know, I've I, I'm going to take a year off and see about a writing career. And a few of my friends were starting to moonlight in the emergency department. You could do it then. And so I, I did some moonlighting and I discovered I liked it and it liked me. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, the best thing about working in the emergency department is, is that, you know, we're on, you know, we could potentially be on duty 168 hours a week. Uh, nights, evenings, there are, you know, we, we're not nine to fivers. Right. Right. As, as I'm sure, as I'm sure, you know, all too well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and, yeah. So, and so, but the beauty of that is that, is that you could do a night shift and then the next day or, or the day after, as you were recovering, you could do interviews during the day. And, uh, so I wrote by day, I worked by night. I did about 10 shifts, uh, night shifts at what became McKenzie health. It was called uh, York central hospital back then. And uh, the rest is history. You know, I wrote for one medium after another, finally decided that radio was great. I worked in TV for a while. And, you know, I had an executive producer who said, Brian, you've got a great face for radio. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> now if that isn't a backhanded compliment, I don't know what is. <laughs> well, you know, and and the fact is that that I love radio because for the same reason you love doing podcasts, right. you can have long conversations where you're not collecting sound bites of 15 seconds or 12 seconds or 8 seconds. You know, now they're sentence fragments. They're not even they're not even sentences anymore. <laughs> and and you can allow people to follow a train of thought. Yeah. And you know, I I I run, I run 10k every other day and I listen to podcasts constantly. And of course you're on my list. So I listen, I listen, to, I listen to the Gritty Nurse podcast and I, I aim to make this your best episode. Oh, you know what? It's already oh, wow. it's already there. Cause I was just like, oh my gosh, she was a comedian too. This is amazing. Like I, like Sarah's right. You are the jack of all trades. Like there's there's so much cool stuff that you're revealing in this episode that we didn't even know about you. Cause of course we did our little research too. But I mean, this is amazing. And and I think that, you know, the fact that you you know, you persevere through all these various different things. And I mean, I think I can empathize with you in, in those moments where it's just like, you have something really, really important to do and you, you've you missed the mark. And I think, you know, uh, I appreciate that story because I think nurses can be really, really hard on themselves and probably other and physicians as well. Oh, yeah. And I yep. think that is just, you know, even our listeners hearing that story, I think it'll resonate with so many other people. All the stuff that you do, how do you have... T- time maybe is that a part of the insomnia or like because it just sounds like you're super busy all the time you know that is a really interesting question you know linking it to the insomnia because uh, I can tell you that you know it's it's a lifelong habit for a reason you know I just I just uh, read a book we had a uh, we had a guest on white coat black art uh, Judd Brewer yeah, yeah. was on the show and 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 uh, he wrote a book called unwinding anxiety you know, he was the first person to kind of put it in my head the idea that you are it's Judson Brewer. That's right. That you could be addicted to anxiety. Wow. Hmm. Really? Yeah. Like, you know, you know, 
I thought oh, you're anxious because you're anxious. So the point of that is that I would wake up for many years. I would wake up early in the morning, like 4 a.m. at the worst of times or 3 a.m., especially during during COVID. It's, you know, it's been a stressful time. But I would, you know, I, more often than not, wake up at 6 o'clock or 5.30 and just feel as if I didn't have a complete night's sleep. Like I was missing at least one cycle of REM, you know, dreaming and that, that kind of thing. And, you know, the first thought when I would wake up is what did I do wrong? Oh, or I'm, I'm being cursed. And it took me a long time to see it as a blessing. It's extra time. And in fact, I would rather do a long run starting at five in the morning than at seven in the morning, because, you know, I can be finishing my, my run when, when my partner Tamara is waking up at, at seven o'clock in the morning. And I feel like I've done that because it sets me up. It's, it's a stress buster for me. Right, right. And yes, and yes, I do a lot of writing and stuff first thing in the morning. You know, it's, it's, it's quiet. Mm -hmm. it, you know, there's a stillness that, in fact, I like to, to run when it's still dark. Yeah. And, and there's a stillness in the air. And, 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 and I say that mindful of the fact that a lot of, uh, a lot of people, particularly women, would not feel comfortable running at four o'clock in the morning right. along a city street. And, and, and so I'm blessed, privileged to be able to do that. And, uh, but, but, you know, certainly part of my coping with insomnia and, you know, the anxieties that I've had over the years is to work, is to do stuff. And, and, you know, it's a case of accomplishing something, turning, turning what could be a bad experience. And instead of having it kind of beat me down, uh, I rise up above it. Wow. And, and so that's part of, and, you know, I, I say this because, there, you know, I had a, I had a, like a friend and a mentor, Rob, you may have, you may have heard of him, Dr. Rob Buckman. Yes, I've heard of him. Who, yep. who, uh, who wrote books like cancer is a word, not a sentence and breaking bad news. And, you know, he, uh, he was a workaholic like me. He passed away a few years ago and I miss him dearly. Uh, and, and his glib answer to how do you manage to accomplish all that uh, is, you know, and he wrote comedy. He was, uh, he was an oncologist. Uh, and he was writing books and, and giving all kinds of speeches. He, his answer would be, it helps if you don't sleep. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> you know, I feel like we have a lot in common now that I've heard you talk about how early you wake up because with the pandemic, I have been waking up earlier and earlier. And I'm embarrassed to admit that I wake up at five these days. Like Amy will tell you, I send her emails and messages like super early. And this is already me delaying the send because I don't want her phone to vibrate at five in the morning. But I find that it just, it's exactly what you said. I feel like this level of clarity, I started drinking coffee during the pandemic, which I, I never drank coffee before. Mm -hmm. And I just feel so much more productive. And I have to say, like, people ask Amy and myself, like, how do we do it? Because we work full time, we have families, we do a lot of things on the side. And I tell people, like, I don't really watch that much Netflix. <laughs> like, I just, I'm not caught up with all of the different shows that people watch because I'm always doing other things or multitasking. And then I, before I know it, three episodes of something have gone by and I don't even know what happened because I was so focused on the work on my computer. So I think we all cope in, in different ways. So what are you watching these days? <laughs> Actually, I'm watching something on Netflix called The Human Body. It's this uh, documentary where they kind of go over every system of the body, but they weave in really interesting stories. So it's not so dry. So I really like that. I, I've been watching. I've been watch. I watched Your Honor. Uh, I watched Defending Jacob, uh, mm -hmm. Mayor of East Town. Oh, it was so good. Yeah, that was that was with uh, Kate Winslet. She executive produced it. She played a detective and I, and it's it's a magnificent limited series. Oh, wow. Yeah. I think my tastes vary a lot because um in the beginning of the pandemic I was hooked on Tiger King. Oh, really? I just couldn't <laughs> I just couldn't take my weight. I couldn't look away from the train wreck. It was, it was fascinating. So I bad. just dug my I just <laughs> dug into it so deep. <laughs> I'm all over the place. Amy, Amy knows that too. Are like I think your tastes and mine, Amy, are really different because yeah, you keep are. talking to me about Bridgerton, <laughs> and for some reason, I just can't click on that show. I just I could not get into Bridgerton either. It was, I mean, the concept <laughs> was fine, but it was no. I, and and you know, the, the love of my life, my soulmate Tamara, could not could not get into it either. So I'm I'm 
glad about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I loved it. I have to be honest. I, I, I do. Maybe I'd say I'd like to have a, a eclectic taste, but I do watch a lot of like, for example, I'm watching now season, I guess it would be season three of Pose. I watch Legendary. So I don't know if you've, you've heard of any of these shows, so Pose. Yep. Yeah. So like, I'm really into, you, you know, um, learning a little bit more about um, transgendered people. Mm-hmm. Um, and Sometimes I actually just also want to watch kind of mindless nonsense. So my husband like, kind of such as is such well, just recently I've been watching a movie and of course I have to watch it in fits and starts with little kids around. Yeah. And um, so la- I actually started watching a movie called Nobody. So it's the I can't remember the name. Oh yeah, that remember. was with the uh, with the uh, Saul. Yes, Better Call Saul. I can't yeah, yeah. remember his oh, name. Oh, I gotta watch that. I love it's that series. So good. Oh my gosh, it's just amazing. So like, I have about half an hour left. I'll probably watch it after I finish the podcast tonight. But like, it is absolutely amazing. So if you get some time, definitely watch Nobody. I think he's an amazing actor. So definitely, uh, that's definitely one to watch during the pandemic and if you have free time. But let's switch gears a little bit here. So, you know, one of the things that Sarah and I would like to say is we're actually really grateful for you. I don't think you realize what you have done for us in terms of our personal lives, as well as just, you know, the Gritty Nurse podcast in general. And, you know, you were actually really the first person to reach out to us. And we are super grateful about that. Um, And also the first to cover frontline nurses and anti-Black racism and racism in healthcare just in general. So why did you think it was important to reach out to us? First of all, you know, I'm grateful to the producers that I've worked with, in particular Sujata Berry. Sujata Berry, I think, has done more to to bring shows. She was a producer on 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 White Coat Black Art. She's she's uh, working on a very important project right now, which is which is, you know, trying to create a set of rules for casual part time employees, which is really important because there's a risk that they can be exploited uh, right. by, by virtue of their coming and going. Uh, and um, she was one of the first producers to, to really say that we've got to, to talk about racism in healthcare. You know, the, the, the conceit, you know, the thing about white coat black art is that we describe the patient experience in the culture of modern healthcare. Right. And 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 that means warts and all like, you know, we're not buffing it and coating it and sugarcoating it. So first of all, um, you know, we, we've done shows on uh, First Nations patients getting second class care. Yeah. And and, you know, we've covered the uh, the awful story of the Joyce Echequan death in, in Quebec and the way she was treated uh, unto death. Um, we've, we've done shows on cultural safety and we not only did those shows about how patients are, are treated, um, and subject to, to racial intolerance, uh, bigotry, abuse, but also, uh, the experience of, of BIPOC, uh, residents and nurses and allied health professionals within the culture of, of, of medicine, how they're treated. And, and, you know, that, you know, it, it, if you're going to do one, you got to do the other. And, and right. so one of the reasons why, why we came to, to you uh, is, is that you've been outspoken. And, you know, frankly, it's hard to find nurses who, <laughs> yeah. who are willing to talk about stuff. And I'm not saying this to blame them. Yeah. We have put nurses, you know, the White Coat Black Heart has been on for 15 years. We've put nurses on the air and, and found out that they were reprimanded and in some oh, cases man. lost their jobs because they came in, in, on our show. Um, right, right. You may you, you may remember hearing about the nurse in Saskatchewan, yes, who wasn't on duty but complained about the care that her grandfather was receiving uh, in a long term care facility, and was complained about by the nurse by 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 by, by I guess call you could call them colleagues. She, they they weren't her colleagues, but they were in the larger sense her colleagues, and they complained to the College of Nurses in, in Saskatchewan. And she was actually sanctioned, and it, and it took it took a lot of money. And it took and, you know, she had to have a Kickstarter campaign. It took uh, it took several appeals until eventually it was quashed. And 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 but look what she had to go through. Yeah. And, and you know, <laughs> I, and I can tell you that that occasionally I've received a complaint to the College of Physicians and Surgeons about columns that I've written. And and, uh, you know, to me, that's a that, that's an abuse of, of the process. Right. But but until you have an, abu- you know, until it's declared an abuse of the process, you have to you have to get a lawyer, you have to defend yourself. And and so the fact that you're willing to speak out is is wonderful. I think it's important. And to be honest, I don't understand why 
locking things tighter than a drum uh, is is a smart play anyway. It just makes institutions look like they've got something to hide. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and I don't know what you think about that, but that's that's my view. No, absolutely. I think this is something Amy and I keep talking about over and over because part of the reason we wanted to do this podcast is to role model the change that we want to see. And the change we want to see is nurses being more vocal and not being afraid to speak out. But really, we just have to uh, show people that it is possible to do so. And I have to say that Amy and I are really fortunate that we work for employers that are supportive of what we do, because I know that's not everyone's experience. And I also think that we happen to be in the right place at the right time. So we started our podcast several months before the pandemic. And so we were already going, we had, you know, our schedule and then the pandemic hit, and then we kind of just went along with it. Um, And then, you know, Black Lives Matters, the the whole George Floyd movement happened, then the anti-Asian racism happened. And we just took every opportunity we could to speak to the media. And as you know, it's it's a lot of work and you have to be available at a moment's notice. But we really felt it was important to highlight um, nurses' struggles because there are so many nurses that are afraid to speak up. And if we're in a position to do so, I think we have to keep going. And one of the things that I'm always fearful of is we happen to be in the right place at the right time. And now that the pandemic, fingers crossed, is is waning, um, we don't want to lose that momentum. Like, how do you think we can prevent ourselves from falling off the radar and continuing to advocate for issues that matter to nurses? Well, you have to, you know, you have to to maintain a pipeline to frontline nurses. Yeah. Uh, And, 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 you know, expand it to allied health professionals. I'd like to think that, that, you know, we don't have to have a podcast that's by personal support workers for personal support workers before we hear the stories. Right. right. So, and I think I, you know, I'd like to think that uh, physicians might come to you, respiratory therapists, uh, you know, other allied health professionals. But, you know, you do what we did before the before the pandemic. We 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 found issues. You you steep yourself in the culture, uh, and you talk to people, and you you don't close it off. Um, you know, one of the one of the ways that we you know became a conduit for stories about paramedics was to do stories about paramedics. Right. And they had, you know, for instance, you know, and, and, and to, to talk to them where they live, where they work about their issues. So for instance, you know, in, in uh, I don't know about, about Hamilton, for instance, but I can tell you about Toronto for a long time, there was a big issue about something called staging. Right. And that, that's what happens when paramedics um, would, uh, you know, because, because there was a report, sometimes it was based on a bit of hearsay coming through the dispatcher that the, the house that they, uh, that the paramedics are supposed to, uh, visit, you know, that, that somebody there may have a weapon or somebody there may be accused of a crime, uh, and may be considered dangerous to paramedics. And so there's this, this policy called staging that says the paramedic crew can stay there, can stay a distance away until the authorities arrive, until, until law enforcement right. arrives. The problem with that is that if you take it to extremes, there's going to be a case where there's a report uh, that that there's a dangerous, a potentially dangerous offender, uh, you know, at the home, and and so you stage, and then you find out that uh, that there was no dangerous offender there, and and meanwhile somebody died, right. somebody died, you know, before assistance could be rendered. Like, how do I know the story? Because we did right. it. And we keep following stories like that. And you and you have to keep following those stories. So, for instance, Mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, the pandemic, we have learned, as I'm sure you. Well, I know this because you and I talked about this, uh, that that there are acute care nurses who are quitting the profession uh, in mid career and in early to mid career. In some cases, they're working two or three years and they're leaving. Uh, where they're going, are they changing jobs? Are they going to a completely different province or, or, or going to another location, another country entirely? I don't know. But, but I do know that something's going on in, uh, in nursing right now in Canada where there's a cohort of experienced young nurses who are not continuing in the profession. And so that's a story that will outlive the pandemic, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's one that I think needs, we need to find out what the heck is going on. Is it, it, you know, we can, I can suspect because I've been following the culture of, of, of nursing for a long time. Um, interest, you know, of course I'm not a nurse, 
and you're well placed to talk to fellow nurses and it's often easier i'm i'm guessing it's easier for you than it is for me as a physician because we get this doctor nurse thing right. going on that yeah. that that creates a, a barrier that i don't want to create and I, and 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 there are no absolutes there are nurses that, that i've had on the show um and and there are other times where this this kind of subtext of a dynamic is going on and and uh, you know i want them to be able like i'm i'm the kind of guy I'd like to be able to do a shift in the emergency department and, and come back the next day. And if it's true, have have a, a, a nursing colleague say, you know, Brian, you really sucked last night. Oh, gosh. <laughs> no, right. because, because honest talk is how, and that because there's something loving about honest yeah. talk and there's something cold about about not hearing, never hearing how you're doing. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the less, you know, if you've got nothing good to say, say nothing like in fact, the most loving thing that you can do to show kindness to other people is to say how you really feel. Right. But that's, mm-hmm. that's so much ingrained into that whole, that whole aspect of silencing, right? Like even circling back to kind of, you know, why are nurses not talking up, speaking out? Um, it, it really goes back to this whole, like, you know, we are pretty much told to kind of, you know, go in, do your job, keep your head down, advocate for patients. Don't speak back. Don't, don't, you know, step too far out of line because we've seen where, you know, let's say a nurse maybe challenged a physician or, or had a different thought that they end up getting, they end up getting crapped on by not just the manager, but maybe even by the director or maybe by, you know, someone from the senior leadership team. We've seen it happen in action as well. And it's just kind of like, it, it baffles our mind when we can see there's stuff that are happening under the surface. Like you said, you're like, do hospitals have stuff to hide? I can tell you, I think it's important for us to have those conversations. And I think that you really pulled out like a silver, like, you know, a smoking gun where it's just like, we should have a culture where we can talk to one another. You know, we have different roles to play, but the whole point in terms of patient safety, seeing better outcomes is, is, you know, giving that feedback to say, Hey, yeah, like you know, maybe they don't say it in the words that like you sucked, but they can say maybe, Hey, you know. I noticed some things that maybe, you know, we can work on as a team in terms of communication or whatever the case may be on that particular shift. But I can tell you that conversation is not going to happen because the the powers that may be or, you know, the people who are supposed to be supporting nurses don't support that conversation. They say they they say they do, but they don't. No. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't. And, you know, and that's a that's a hard one to to accept uh, and understand. Unt- uh, but you know it once you th- you've heard the patois that says that says if you see something say something and one day you say something right. and you discover that they're investigating you not the person not the person you said something about so and and you know what's what, what Amy what's really interesting about about this what you're talking about right now is the tension between between um, you know, they're, they're, it's actually, you know, considered ethical behavior for nurses. Correct me if I'm wrong. To to take uh, that that if you if you see something, to take it up the chain of command only, and and in fact, you know, to to uphold the nursing profession is is to not stay to not say bad things about about fellow nurses. Um, on the one hand, you have that. You know, my sense is that, and I think it's very much the same in medicine in terms of the culture that 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 you would have yep. to invent a whistleblower mm-hmm. I, in I, order to have whistleblowers that in other words it wasn't it isn't part of it isn't part of the dna of of doctors doctors have a very militaristic right. kind of quasi militaristic culture the, we have a chain of command it's not it's not the military but but that's how it works and and you're supposed to obey you know you're supposed to obey the chain of command and and not take it outside otherwise and we've done shows about whistleblowing among among doctors among physicians among among nurses and and how hard it is and how and you know what you have to do to to carry through you know the, with the repercussions of whistleblowing when it should be easier than it is mhm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think part of the problem is I'm um, just going back to speaking to the media. I've spoken to nurses who say many nurses are afraid to speak to the media because they say that uh, their organization says so not allowed to. And that we know that for the most part, that's not accurate. If they're not speaking about anything confidential, they're not speaking about their particular organization, but they're advocating for general issues that affect nurses and healthcare, that that is okay. But the on the other um, hand, we've heard of yep. nurses, their own colleagues, 
that have been treating those nurses poorly. So they've gone to speak to the media, let's say about an issue with, um, I don't know, paid sick days, let's say. Um, and then they start to notice this passive aggressive behavior from their own colleagues where, you know, they're not getting the shifts that they want anymore. They're not getting the assignments that they want anymore. They're not paired with the same break buddy mm -hmm. they've had before. So there's almost like this nurses eating their young because of whatever reason they are feeling jealous. They didn't like how this nurse, you know, is advocating, you know, she's doing better than me. And that is a lot of the issues that we encounter as well is from our own profession, Never mind all of the other issues that can come with speaking to the media or advocating because we never learn how to do these things in nursing school. You mentioned uh, nurses eating their young, which is not my phrase, uh, but we did it. We did a show, a pretty groundbreaking show, and it's actually a long time ago now, 13 years ago on uh, on nurse bullying. That's how mm -hmm. long since we did that show. Yeah. I'm shaking my head. You can't see this, but I, I could I could tell you it probably hasn't changed at all. Like, I mean, and and this is where I continue to, you know, talk to nurses to say, OK, so speaking up and, and I, th I think I actually said this to you, Brian, on one of our interviews where it's like, you know, I'm actually not saying anything that's egregious. Right. I'm not saying some, you know, I'm not out there saying outlandish things. I'm not I'm not making anything up. I'm not just, you know, fabricating. I'm just saying what I see in my own experience or, you know, I'm, I'm speaking about anti-black racism or anti-Muslim racism or, you know, anti like anti-Semitism. I'm speaking about things that, you know, to me on the surface should be like a no brainer. It's like, why aren't we talking about, you know, the treatment of anti-indigenous people? Why aren't we talking about, you know, some of these issues in healthcare where we see, you know, racism actually occurring? Like, I don't think I'm saying anything that's controversial. So again, when we swing it back the other way, and we're like, okay, you know what, this nurse is going to get in trouble. I think that's, it's outlandish. It's ridiculous that nurses feel that they, they, they can't embody who they would be on not on a 12 hour shift. I don't feel like I should have to be one way on, you know, while I go into work, and then another way when I get home, I think I'm the same person when I go in genuine at on my shift as I am when I leave. And I think that that authenticity is huge, is hugely important. And I think that nurses should be political. We should be able to say, you know, call a spade a spade, but I don't know if it's just, I don't want to say it's my generation because I don't think it's that either. It's just, I feel like I've kind of gotten to the point in my life where I think if I don't say something about things that I won't see change. Yeah. You know, I, I think there is a generational aspect to this and it may be in the same way that younger people are, are more likely to drive faster because they haven't experienced the consequences of being in an accident. Uh, and that once you are, once real life starts to happen to you, um, that takes some of these, that takes some of the impetus out of you to, to, to speak up. There are, I think it's fair to mention that there are two kinds of speaking up and you and I, through our mutual podcasts and shows have found the sweet spot. You can, right. you can raise issues without necessarily naming institutions. And you right. can say, just by saying it happens, racism happens. But the minute you start, and, 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 and I think that's a way to do it and it raises public attention about it, but it doesn't speak to a particular institution. To, right. to, to change something at an institution, you know, in Joliet, Quebec right now, for instance, I think the only yes. way you're gonna change that institution is by naming it. And, right. and, you know, it, it was, look, if, if we didn't have those Facebook postings, you know, the video, yep. the live video, we wouldn't be having a conversation about Joyce Eshaquan right now, the late Joyce Eshaquan, we, because it would have been swept under the rug. Absolutely. Because that, that's, what, that's what happens, yeah. But to the point, you know, if we see racism, anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Muslim, anti you know, Islamophobia, if, if, if we see that or unprofessional remark about women, about people who are trans, uh, who are non-binary, don't we have an obligation to speak up in our institution? I hope so. I believe we should. <laughs> yeah, I believe we should as well. And let me take it one step further. If we get no action when we have spoken up, then, you know, according to the whistleblower's guide, we should be protected if we go to the media because, you know, we took it up the chain of command, which is the ethical professional thing to do. And if they do nothing about it, uh, you know, now it depends on what they, you know, what we mean by nothing about it. Uh, right. You know, I would presume they would come back to us and say we conducted an investigation and and this is what we found. Uh, and, you know, we found that there's, you know, there, we can't do any charges. We are very concerned about this and we will keep monitoring the situation, whatever it is. 
but but if they you know if it's clear that something happened and you've got the goods and they and they won't do anything about it then you know some would say you have an obligation to take it somewhere where somebody's going to pay attention to it and do something about it that is a really good way of looking at it i have never thought it out that way before i'm glad that you kind of laid it out logically because we're always thinking like we're we're not thinking of that process i think the way that you described it is that you go up the chain of command and if things aren't happening, then you do go to the media because they are the voice of a lot of, um, you know, marginalized, vulnerable groups that really don't have a voice. Yeah, but it's it's such a tricky situation, too, because like if you're going to the media and you're trying to tell a story, mm-hmm. there's also a patient component to that. too. Yep. So how do you how do you how do you navigate all that? Is it that now you're, you, you know, from, from the nursing standpoint, are you, you know, bridging that therapeutic communication or that therapeutic relationship patient and client, sorry, patient and nurse relationship where, you know, you're now saying, I'm going to help you and talk about this to the media and they agree. Like there's, there's so many complexities within that situation itself where I have to be honest, this whole journey for hospitals and learning how to be anti-racist, I can't believe it's like just starting to happen. (laughs) Like it's, it's really, really Mm -hmm. bizarre to me where it's just like, you know, you know, maybe I'm, I'm approached or someone's like, what, what, what does, what happens at your organization? I'm like, okay, well, you know, like nothing or, or, you know, we're just starting this journey. And it's, I think a lot of organizations don't really actually know what to do, right? It's just kind of like, okay, this is happening. We need to do something about it, but they don't know exactly what that mark may look like or what the next step may be. And I think there are actually some great people that organizations can lean on in terms of understanding, you know, what are the next steps when we're identifying racism in healthcare and what can we actually do about it? Because I can tell you, you know, they have these internal reporting systems. You, you mentioned it, Brian, but I can tell you when it comes, when it trickles down back or does it actually come full circle back for like, you know, maybe a frontline nurse. And I'd say that most of the times it kind of doesn't, right? So they don't feel that that loop is fully closed. So, it, you know, maybe it'll go back to you, Brian, or it might go back to someone who's in more of a position of authority, but to bring it back full circle to, you know, someone who's affected at the front line, they might actually not have that fo- that that piece where, you know, they're like, okay, now I need to go X, Y, Z, speak to the media. But I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of like, what does this look at? What does this actually look like in healthcare? And I, and I have to say it is about action. It can't just be like, you know, um, this horrible thing that happened to a nurse or happened to a physician where, you know, let's say some, a patient came in even, and, you know, called them a racist name. And, you know, this behavior was continued to occur. Like, I think there actually has to be very concrete, specific, actionable things that people can say, yes, we're actually going to move the mark on making change in terms of racism in healthcare. But I think, I think we, we have quite the journey because people are still afraid to talk about it. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right about that. And, and you know, the, the kind of dominant cultural response in the past has been that if, if you notice stuff and complain about it, that you get labeled a complainer. It, yeah. You know, it's, it's a form of shooting the messenger. And, 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 that's, the, and, and that's a problem. Uh, you know, my sense is that, uh, you know, authorities, institutions like hospitals are, are just beginning to grapple with the, with, with, with the, the dilemmas and, and the challenges of representing everybody's point of view and, and, and recognizing that kind of a dominant white settler point of view, uh, is it, it, that's what's dominated. And if you see things through that lens, then, then you're going to have a lot of trouble understanding that uh, other people would feel differently, you know, that, that a multiplicity of unconscious biases against patients of color. And, right. uh, and, and, and that it manifests itself in so many ways, which we found, which we have found out during the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I hope that it will lead to, you know, that the pandemic has, by exposing a lot of these issues will lead to a period of enlightenment, but, but there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. Well, <laughs> speaking of, you know, period, having a period of enlightenment, it's, it's actually shown us that, you know, health misinformation is quite rampant as well. And I think that is some like an ever moving target and battle. Like mm-hmm. it's just like, like I said, you know, going on Twitter and I'm like, Oh, I'm reading through, I'm doom scrolling. Or, you know, I'm, I'm now seeing a, a conflict between two people about, you know, magnetism and, and, you know, the COVID-19 vaccine and I'm rolling my eyes. But the thing is, 
that one post has over 30,000 views. So I'm like, okay, well, you can't just roll your eyes now, right? So from your standpoint and from, you know, even our standpoint, what do we need to continue to do? And what do you think the best way is for us to continue through social media, through using our positions as nurses and physicians? How do we continue to combat the misinformation that we're seeing out there? Well, you know, certainly use your platform to, to call it as you see it. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, I guess the, even before that, let me back up and say the first thing you should do is, I think, is, is uh, hew to science. And that means follow the science, you know, keep, yeah. in, keep in mind the, 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 the fact that science changes. Um, it's, it's actually, you know, when you listen to, uh, you know, when you, when you listen to, to historians and, 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 and authors like, you know, Lawrence Wright has just written a book, published a book about the pandemic and all the failures uh, and, and, you know, there are lots of things that I'm not proud of, uh, in my own, right. you know, I, I, there were times when I parroted the, the party line, you know, the, the official line, scientific line that, that, that masks were of no value. when in fact, masks were probably the best thing you could have done from the very beginning. Um, I, uh, you know, I said on the dose, or at least I, you know, I, I, I brought somebody on the show who said there was no evidence that, uh, that COVID-19 came from a lab. Uh, when, when we don't know, we just don't know the answer to that question. And, and, and Chinese authorities have thrown a blanket over the, uh, over the whole issue. And, and to this date have not provided samples. You know, now, now we hear that, that it's possible that, uh, you know, what was supposed to be a, a level four facility, uh, that in fact, it was the level two part of the, of the facility in Wuhan that was, that was experimenting with, uh, with the coronavirus. And, and, you know, as Lawrence Wright has said, uh, you know, with, with all of the quality control, infection control of a dentist's office, not that there's anything wrong with the dentist's office, but that's not how you handle <laughs> yeah. biologically, uh, uh, dangerous, uh, samples. So hew to the science, be humble, um, and be skeptical, uh, and all that stuff is really important. No, I completely respect mm-hmm. that. And I think that it's actually important that, like what you said, you know, the science is changing like daily or hourly almost some t- at some points. And I think we did a couple episodes and a couple videos at the beginning of the pandemic. And we were just like, yeah, you know, this will be done in the next couple months. And, you know, foolishly, we didn't realize how the severity of it either. And I think that that's where you can come back and you can say, you know what, I made a mistake and this is what the new evidence is saying. And I think that's okay. I think the acknowledgement and understanding that you're trying to do the best that you can, you're trying to provide people with the best available evidence at that current time is admirable. And also that if you do slip up, that it's okay to be like, hey, you know, actually I misstepped, I misspoke because we're human, right? And I think that someone would rather that than doubling down on something that's actually not realistic. Mm -hmm. I think back to that episode, and I'm so glad that at the beginning, we said the date that we recorded it. I think it was like March 15th, 2020, because it was the best information we had at the time. And a lot of the things we said on that podcast were what was, you know, being uh, supported by the World Health Organization, by Health Canada. So this was the information that everybody was going on. But as you said, it changes and it evolves. And we now know based on evidence and research that different things are best practice. And so it's okay to take that risk, I think, because we do have to give people some information rather than misinformation. Absolutely. And and Sarah, you know, to, to that point. So, okay. So having having said that, now... If people are putting up misinformation, for instance, uh, don't wear a mask or or yeah. natural yeah. immunity is better than a vaccine. Uh, and then 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 I think we have an obligation to call it. And and we also have an obligation to to not slavishly present uh, two points of view that are not equivalent. You know, one is evidence based and the other is not evidence based. Then th- there's no obligation to present the view that's not evidence based. That's that's crap if we can call it that. So mm-hmm. I think that you know we need to be responsible. And uh, you know, all that said, you know, we have certainly on White Coat Black Art, we did a show uh, on um, uh, healthcare providers who are reluctant to roll up their sleeves and uh, and and take the vaccine. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, in, in, in those cases, the best approach uh, is not to browbeat or yell and scream and get angry, although, you know, you can if you want. The most effective approach is to empathize and try to find out, you know, right. what are the reasons why 
uh, somebody might be reluctant to, to take a vaccine. It may be because of some historical perspective that's valid. It may be because they haven't received information that answers their questions. Uh, perhaps it's not in their own language. Perhaps uh, it's not in a time and place at a time and place where they can be fully engaged in it. Uh, there may be all kinds of reasons. And, and, you know, certainly we've presented, we've done at least one show where we talked about the value of an empathic approach, being em empathetic to people uh, who have questions about vaccines and, and, and acknowledging that, that they have a choice when it comes to vaccines and that they are engaged in trying to, to take care of their health the best way that they can. And that that works better than browbeating somebody or, or screaming or, or saying that they're stupid or foolish or whatever, that that kind of approach just doesn't work. No, I, I completely hear that. And, and honestly, the, the struggle is real. So like on my side of the family, like I'd say the majority of us, you know, we, we believe that the vaccine is something that's important to take. As do but I. then, you know, like I, I, I have my father-in-law who is of a completely different mind. He listens to rebel media. That's it. He like trying to change his mind is just it's 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 actually probably not going to happen so for for peace sake we actually just don't talk about it because there's no point for, i think you know i think we actually had um dr lawrence Lowe come on recently and he said to us he's like there's going to be three types of people there's going to be people that want to get the vaccine and they've done their research there's going to be people that are in between and you know you're going to try to navigate you know what exactly is making them apprehensive or you know what is the underlying cause as to why they might not want to get a vaccine and there's going to be people people that just i guess you would say gets that free pass and they they just won't and i mean I, I'm glad that you kind of mentioned what you did, uh, Brian, because I think sometimes you just have to, you know what, we have to go the empathetic route and I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to continue trying to understand why, even though he's presented various different ideas to me, but I think at the end of the day, my, my job is to continue to inform and educate as much, as best as I can at the time. And now it's it, interesting. We are, in, you know, we're heading, you know, at, as of the date of, of this podcast, we're heading into a very interesting period of time when the issue of mandatory vaccines for healthcare workers um, is going to yep. be raised. It's a, it's an issue, you know, and hospitals are starting to talk about, you know, certainly in Ontario, hospitals are starting to talk about what are the rules of engagement going to be. Uh, you know, either you take the vaccine, if you don't take the vaccine, do you have to do an educational module? Yes probably. Uh, and you'll have to wear a mask for the duration yeah. and, and, uh, and practice, you know, specific, you know, specified infection control procedures over and above what, what, uh, vaccinated, uh, colleagues will have to do. Uh, although I have to tell you, I think with the variants of concern, like the Delta variant, I don't see us stopping our, our masking up and wearing face shields anytime soon, to be honest. No, I, I agree with that. I, I saw those threads a little bit today and seeing some of the conversations that were occurring. Uh, they were talking about, you know, wh whether you're patient facing or not, or like, should a psychiatrist have to? And I think that, you know, there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done to up ahead to kind of say like, where does this make sense? But I, I personally feel that masks and face shields, like you said, are going to be here to stay for quite some time. And, and I'll ask you guys, do, you, do have you met any colleagues who were double vaccinated and yet and still got COVID? I have not met any to date yet. I have. I have not personally. I've heard of a friend of a friend. So I do know that it's not foolproof. Um, there are breakthrough infections that can occur for sure. And, and now this person wasn't sick, you know, thankfully. So the vaccine obviously blunted the, the severity of their illness. But the inconvenience is, is you know, is, is, not to be, is not to be trivialized. It's, it's, it's a huge inconvenience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've, I've only heard of one person who had just one dose. And she still said to me that, um, even though she had the one dose, she still said she felt like hell <laughs> and she was, she was off for quite some time. Wow. So, I mean, I, I think that we're going to, we have to keep seeing what's happening. We got to follow the science. We, I, I can't, you know, the fact that we have this other variant coming in, I, I feel, I feel that masks are going to be here to stay for quite some time. Yeah. And I think we just have to stay vigilant because now we're at a time where things have opened up for the first time in a very long time. And we can't really let our guard down with everything that we know is probably going to be coming down the pipeline and not to be doom and gloom, but it, it is coming and we just need to be prepared for it. Um, so 
Brian, I know we have talked, I feel like I've really enjoyed this conversation. I feel like we could talk all night if we wanted to, but just um, in the interest of time, was there anything else that you want to add that we may have missed or anything that we should circle back to? Um, no, you know what? Uh, you know, we, we could certainly make an appointment <laughs> yeah. to have another conversation <laughs> down the road. I've certainly, I've certainly enjoyed speaking with, with the two of you and, uh, and, uh, you know, enjoyed having you on, on our show. And uh, I'm sure that you'll be on our show again. Uh, you're, you know, we kind of fishing in the same pond. We are, uh, you know, we're friends. And I'm really glad that you're doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you so much. Thank and, you. And thank you for coming on. Like, t- it was an honor. It's, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, to speak with like-minded people. And then also learning something new. Like I think that there's a lot that people listening can take away from this conversation. There was a lot that I, definitely even I took away. And I mean, I think, I think that we just need to continue having these conversations. We need to continue to, you know, empower people to, to be able to speak up. Cause I think that's another really big, important issue. And again, you know, just, I think if there's one thing the pandemic has revealed is we need to, to be better, together we need to be able to you know um I'm, I'm trying to think about the right word but i think it's revealed that we need to show that human side we need to understand what it is like to have compassion and i think that you know as much as it's tiring and there's a lot of work ahead i think that we're, we're going down the right path amen to that i agree <laughs>